This episode of Worldview Everlasting is brought to you by the letter AWESOME. The numbers Sweet Action and Issues Etc. Talk Radio for the Thinking Christian. Issues ETC dot O-R-G. Hey, Internet. So, yeah, I, I don't really feel like standing and, and quite doing all the work that I need to do today, given the number of other things that I need to get done today, which is good and bad and much and full and all that and all. But, yeah, just finished reading the uh, Greek text for this week, and I didn't want you to entirely miss out on Greek Tuesday. So, here we are. We're going to go a little different style today, um, hopefully giving you at least some of what you're hungering for, because, you know, addictions need to be fed. Yes. All right, today's text for Trinity Sunday. This coming Sunday is Trinity Sunday, the first Sunday after Pentecost, in which normally we will do something like say the Athanasian Creed and remember the ancient debates about whether or not Jesus is actually God and whether or not the Spirit is actually God. And we confess with all Orthodox Christians, like the definition of what it means to be a Christian, that Father, Son, and Spirit are one God in three persons, one essential divinity, yet three distinct people, something that ultimately is, is well, uh, incomprehensible to us, which if you think about it, God should be incomprehensible to us because God is God and we're not. We're these limited little finite creatures. You know, in the in confirmation class this morning, uh, one of the kids brought up a question that an atheist had brought to him saying, well, who made God? How can God exist? Because because if God is God, like who made him? And so, you know, so you have this little finite person with a beginning and an end who can't conceive that there could be something that's not finite but infinite with no beginning and no end. And so because of his limited brain, he therefore says it can't be which is really just like the height of arrogance if you think about it. If God does exist as something bigger than we who have beginnings and ends, shouldn't he have no beginning and end and be incomprehensible? If you can wrap your head around God, isn't he really not God at that point? I mean, you're God at that point, since you can understand him fully and, and see him from the outside and look at him as if he has, you know, is under you. Anyhow, so Trinity Sunday, rock on. The text for Trinity Sunday is John chapter 3, verses 1 through 17, which is a very famous text. And you're going to f- be familiar with lots of this. It's the story of Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night. It's got that famous verse, for God so loved the world, or God loved the world so much, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then it's got this even better verse, honestly, seriously, even better, about how Moses had to lift up a snake on a pole and how just as he did that so also the son of man is going to be lifted up and when he does so all that believe in him will have life Ah. all right so key things about john Uh, john is a very different book than uh, matthew mark and luke and he works heavily with themes especially the themes of uh, light and darkness the themes of water blood and spirit themes of life and death and themes of witness or testimony that words and uh, and people specifically are set to be bearing wis- witness or confessing or setting forth truth, right? You're going to see a number of those themes in this text. You're going to see the theme of water, which the first whole half of John really deals with water. The second half deals with food and blood intermittently, and then they're brought together in the cross of Christ when water and blood spew from his side. Spirit is kind of around underneath the whole thing, and, and then he really is giving up the spirit as the water and blood are spewing from his side, which kind of brings all things together at this cross where he's been lifted up as a snake on a pole. In the darkness, even though he himself is the light come into the world. Whoa! John works like that. It's like just full of symbolic beauty and metaphor, but none of his metaphor is, is actually true. Jesus is not a metaphorically the light of the world. He is the light. He is the lamb at the center of the universe from which all light comes. You see this in the other books in his transfiguration, right? Well, John doesn't always pull on things the same way the other books do. So John doesn't talk a lot about baptism. He just kind of has Jesus baptizing and his disciples baptizing and John baptizing, but never really talks about it. Instead, he talks about water and spirit. That's what we're going to see in today's text. There was a man of the Jews named Nicodemus, a Pharisee and a ruler among the Jews, and he comes to Jesus at night in the darkness, which is not a good sign. You don't do things in the darkness, and Jesus is going to say this, that those who do things in the darkness do so because their works are evil. So there's this little hint here that Nicodemus is not really on the good side of things, at least at this moment in the text. This is not to say that Nicodemus isn't saved. That's a whole different question. And so far as the text is concerned, what Jesus is going to be interacting with with Nicodemus is a negative example. One other piece of the way John works is he puts pairs of examples together all the way through his gospel. And so as Nicodemus is meeting Jesus in the dark, the very next story is going to have a woman, a Samaritan adulteress, meeting Jesus in the middle of the day 
in the light. And both conversations are going to revolve around water, spirit, life, salvation, son of man, Messiah, all this stuff, but they play off each other. It is in their diversity that you can actually see the single truth coming through. Nicodemus is the negative example. He comes in the darkness. This man who ought to know who Jesus is, he's been waiting for the Messiah. He is a teacher among teachers amongst the Jews, and yet, as we're going to see, he doesn't really understand much of anything. In fact, it looks as if he's maybe even coming to kind of like, you know, play Jesus a little bit. He says, teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God. Now, there are two different words there for teacher. One is rabbi, which means teacher, and the other word is didaskalos, which is maybe like more efficiently translated as indoctrinator. Teacher, we know that you are an indoctrinator come from God, which in our day and age, we hate doctrine because we hate authority. We hate anything that would tell us this is true and it just is true and we can't change it. And so we wouldn't use that word. We would put something nice like, you know, friendly encourager or something like that, right? Well, he says, we know that you're an indoctrinator come from God because no one can do the signs, and he's only done one so far. He's changed water into wine, but we kind of assume the miracles are going around this. No one can do the signs that you are doing, Jesus, unless you are, he is from God, or unless God is with him. Which is interesting because truly, and he should know this too, I mean, the witch at Endor was able to call up the dead. It's not like evil doesn't have the ability to do some supernatural things in the world, even in the Hebrew Old Testament. It's not like the demons that are possessing individuals in this very time in Jesus' life aren't capable of actually breaking some of the rules of reality that we would call observable, scientific, materialistic, empirical, all those things. Anyway, so even this statement's kind of like a stupid statement from Nicodemus, if he's a student of the scriptures, which he is, he's just, he's trapped within his own little system, right? But Jesus knows that this is all a play. He, he knows that Nicodemus coming to him at night in secret doesn't actually believe he's a teacher come from God, but is coming to test him. And so, he kind of challenges him right off the bat. Amen, amen, he says. I say to you that, that unless a person is born again from above once more, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, in the past on the show, we've talked about this word anothen. Does it mean from above? Does it mean again? I think it's actually double entendre, meaning both from above and again. But it's clear in the text that Nicodemus takes this to mean again, to be born a second time. So Jesus is saying that unless a man, a person, is brought forth, begetted, begotten, born something a second time, he can't see the kingdom of God. Well, it's like, huh? What are you talking about, Jesus? I mean, seriously, I mean, even right now, as Christians, we, we don't really get this, right? It's like, we have to like say, Jesus, can you explain this a little bit more to us, please? And that's basically what Nicodemus does, although he tries to understand it and assumes that Jesus is speaking in an empirical way. Go get this, in a way that is entirely physically trapped in the scientific world. He says, how can a man be brought forth, born, when he has already become an old man? Can he enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? Notice how trapped and limited his thinking is into like what he can touch and see and taste. We assume empiricism is just a purely modern thing. It's not. It's just the human skepticism that is really partial to our flesh. So Jesus says to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a person is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Oh, okay. That makes it make so much more sense, Jesus. Thank Thank you for clearing that right up for me. <laughs> Is, huh? Well, that's just it. Who is John writing to and when is he writing? He's writing in the 90s AD, well after Christianity is established, and he's writing to the church. And so the moment he starts mentioning something like water and the Spirit, the Christians are going to be like, oh, I know what that means. That's baptism, because that's where the Holy Spirit forgives my sins. Oh my goodness. So Jesus is talking about baptism. But for Nicodemus, see, baptism hasn't even really been given in the way that Jesus gives it yet. That's what's going to happen immediately following today's text as Jesus starts baptizing people and then sending his disciples to baptize. And so, in one sense, Jesus can't be talking about baptism yet, except for that he is talking about baptism baptism in this sort of water spirit bloody kind of way that he does all the way through his book where he's wanting us to put connections together that are bigger than the immediate text. But what he is immediately talking about is what the spirit's work is. What does the Holy Spirit do? And this again becomes a massive theme throughout the entire book John. What does the spirit do? Well that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So all human beings created, created originally good but in Adam having fallen now inherit his flesh, being nothing more than dead in our trespasses and sins. We cannot live. Watch it. We're all out there. We're dying. It takes us about 80 years, but we're all doing it pretty consistently. A gradual slow march into the grave. That which is born of flesh can only be that. It must eventually inherit the curse of that flesh, which is death. But that which is born of the spirit, that is the true spirit, the breath from God that actually creates life in the first place, it is spirit. It is eternal life. Life from life does not die. 
That's how we should know immediately we got a problem. Our life keeps dying. There's something wrong with it. True life never dies. So Jesus goes on, don't marvel that I said to you that you have to have life given to you again, to, that you have to be born again since I mean, you're clearly dying and you know your own scriptures teach you this, that this curse of death has been wrought upon the world. Don't marvel at this. Why is this such a big deal? And then the next phrase, the wind blows wherever it pleases. It's just so weird. Uh, in Greek, you have this one word, pneuma, and it means both spirit and wind and breath. And it means all those things at the same time. They're not three different things. We translate them three different ways because in English we have these distinctions that we've created between them, but it's not really there in the Greek that the wind is the breath, is the spirit, especially when you're talking about how it you know results within a human, <sighs> right? My life is connected to my breath, which is in fact breathed. <laughs> So I'm not a fan, as I've said before, of translating the same word different ways in the same verse when there's no good reason, that colloquial reason being given to do that. So when you're saying that which is born of spirit is spirit, and it's the same word, that which is born of wind is wind, that which is born of breath is breath, maybe you should kind of keep it as spirit. So I'm going to translate this as the spirit blows wherever he desires. This is the spirit gives life wherever he desires. The spirit spirits wherever he desires. And literally it's the same root word. And you hear his sound. What's that? Oh, the speaking, the word of God itself. This, and of course, Nicodemus doesn't quite know this yet. Jesus hasn't come out and said, I am the way and the truth and the life and my word is life yet. But that's the idea. The spirit is in fact preaching wherever he desires to preach. But you don't know where he comes from or where he goes. That is, we have no control over whether this is going to create faith. Ultimately, the spirit is the one in charge of begetting new life into humanity. So we hear his sound, but we're not in control of him. And so it is then with all who are being born of the spirit, all who are having faith created in them by the word of God, right? So this guy comes to Jesus in the dark. He says, we know you're a teacher. He's like, oh yeah, I'm a teacher. Let me tell you something pretty basic. You have to be baptized by the word of God, which is going to connect itself to water eventually. Although I'm not telling you that part yet, but at the very least, this has to make you alive out of death again. And this is a new life, a new birth. And Nicodemus is like, huh? What the heck? I don't get it. And Jesus is like, you don't get it. The word of God has to come and give you the Holy Spirit to re-put life into your dead carcass of, of a soul. And that this is up to God to do and you don't really have a choice. And so here, look, you want me to teach? I'm teaching life. <sighs> and Nicodemus then is like, well, uh... Um, how, how can this be? Which is, interestingly, the way that all humans normally would respond. The natural man does not accept the things of God. That's why in our present day, when we just idolize science and materialism so very much, so many Christians cannot handle the fact that Jesus could possibly use water and his word together to do this and give you the promise of faith. Anyhow, kind of a different thing. So Nic Nicodemus, though, he doesn't get it. He is not receptive. He is fighting against this revelation. It's kind of what's happening to everyone in this context. Very few f people are believing in Jesus, and even those who do, in the text, they don't really get who he is and what he's going to do anyway. So Nicodemus says, how can these things be? And Jesus gets a little you know, and miffed off at it. You're a teacher of Israel. I mean, you're, you're like the greatest that they have to, to give. You're, you're the the leader of the church, and you don't understand these things, which should tell you something. If you ever have a leader of your church that says, I'm no theologian, um, go to this verse and just kind of think about that for a second. Yeah. Jesus goes on. Amen. I tell you, we are speaking of what we know. And who's the we in this? Well, him and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Because they're working together. We are speaking of what we know, and we are testifying to what we have seen. He's going to tell you where he saw it in just a moment. But you, and this is a plural you, I mean, he's talking about the entire nation of Israel already. I mean, he's just started his ministry. You, all people do not receive what we speak, what we testify to. And if I've been telling you something that's as basic as this, a base thing, an earthly thing, something epigeia, out of Gaia, out of the earth. How can I tell you something epurania, celestial, out of heaven? How can I tell you that? You're not going to understand that. If you can't understand that you are dead and that the word of God by the spirit must breathe life into you and that I'm going to say this is connected to water just because I have the right as God to say that. Well, how can I tell you about the life of the world to come? I mean, check it out. Nobody has ascended to heaven to know the mind of God except for the son of man who has descended to bring this mind to you. And here I am speaking and you're going to tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about. I mean, I think Jesus has the right to say this, right? And so he goes on. And I tell you this, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so also the son of man must be lifted up. That in fact is why I'm here. So that whoever believes in him, in what of him? Well, that this death is payment for sin and that his resurrection is justification for all mankind. Whoever believes this unbelievable truth may have eternal life. And it is an unbelievable truth. Christianity is an unbelievable truth. That's why the Spirit must, in fact, breathe life into you to make you born again. You can't believe Jesus rose from the dead. Nobody rises from the dead. That's the stupidest thing that you could possibly ever believe. Why would you ever believe that? It is irrational. It is non-empirical. It is illogical in every sense. And yet, it actually did happen. And 
you actually believe it. So the unbelievable you've believed, not because of your own reason or strength, but because this spirit has blown where he wished, which is into your heart, to create faith in this word which Jesus spoke and then did. The fact that he's united this to water to make it a promise that you can't deny, that you are in baptized, there's nothing you can do about it, it's on you, done, you're sealed with the sign of the Holy Spirit, uh, all the better. And all of this is because, in this same way, because God loved the world, so he gave his only begotten Son, in order that everyone, all, each, who believe in him, should not be destroyed, but have and possess eternal life, being born again out of death. Because God did not send his son into the world to judge the world or to condemn the world, although it's going to be translated as judge later, so judge, condemn, uh, to, to put a judgment on the world, which if we know what the right judgment is upon us, it is condemnation. God didn't send his son Jesus as that judge, at least not yet, but in this first coming, but he sent him in order to save the world. And that's where our text stops, but you got to keep going. The one who believes this is not judged. The one who does not believe this has already received his judgment. What's that? Death. You don't want to escape death. You don't want to have death lose its sting and have a victory over death. Fine, don't believe in Jesus. I mean, he is the only religious answer in the world where death has been defeated in reality, in an empirical and material way of all things. For you, O oh doubtful one, to have an escape from the curse of decay and the result of your spiritual corpse-likeness. Yeah? The one who does not believe in him has received the judgment already and is just going to get what that judgment is. And this is the judgment. That the light is and has come into the world. That's Jesus standing right there before Nicodemus in the midst of the darkness. But the men love the darkness because their deeds are are evil. Because everyone who does evil things, of course, hates the light, because the light would expose what their evil things are. But the one who does what is true comes to the light so that it can be clearly revealed that what he has done has been carried out in God. And you can take that at the end and say, oh, that must be about me and me needing to do good works and be righteous, but that would be like totally to miss the point. No, Jesus is talking about himself right there. That the one who is in the light has no fear of darkness or light because what he's doing is in God and it will prove itself true. That proof is the day of resurrection on which his works were vindicated. The good news is that those works were done for your sake. All right, well, that's going to be our time for today, and hopefully that helps you a little bit. Lots of good stuff. Great text. Plenty to preach on. We didn't even go into the Moses and the snake on the pole thing, I and mean, you could do like 15 sermons just on that reference. So anyway, rock on. Got to get this up, and uh, you guys have a good time. We will see you. <laughs>